this is an exciting evening because hundreds of years ago, this young lady showed up smiling, interested, came to the club, and she was interested in astronomy and was in the club, and we've kept in touch through the years. And she was a sophomore um, at Syosset, and her teacher was Linda Prince. And um, Mr. Slezinski. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, both. They were both. Um, so this is this is <laughs> wonderful. But anyhow, then she went off to Stony Brook University, and um, when she graduated from, she was a summer intern. I'm giving away your talk. Anyhow. She is here tonight after this astounding journey from a sophomore in um, high school, and I'm not going to tell you where she is now, but she is. So, uh, Jessica Lee. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Jess. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, how I got into astronomy and what I'm currently doing in um, astrophysics right now. So for today's talk, let me tell you a bit about myself, who I am, where I came from, and briefly tell you about what I work on right now. Then I'll talk about what you normally can't see through your telescope in the backyard, which leads to a discussion about how we can see these invisible processes with spectroscopy. I'll provide some background information on how light behaves as it moves through and around certain materials, including diffraction gratings, and how UV astronomy is important in figuring out how things in the universe evolve over cosmic time. I'll discuss some key challenges for UV observations and instrumentation, and how we are trying to develop technology as we navigate through these challenges. In particular, I'll talk about my part in UV grading technology development, and I'll finally circle back to how this technology development relates back to the science and astrophysics I study, and how they're applied to a couple of missions that I'm working on. To wrap it up, I'll tell you what we're hoping to see in the future of the UV astrophysics world. Can everyone in the back hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. So I came to ASLI as a sophomore in high school. Ken Spencer was really warm and welcoming when I first joined the club. I was really excited to learn how to build my own telescope and grind my own mirror. So he offered me a mirror blank, carborundum grit, polishing rouge, polishing lap, and some books. So the image on the left here is the mirror blank that I was working on grinding along with the polishing lap. In college, I still visited Astley occasionally, and I feel really fortunate to have made lifelong friends from this group. I completed my triple major in astronomy, physics, and mechanical engineering. Then I got my master's degree in mechanical engineering at the, um, Stony Brook University. I interned and was later hired as a mechanical engineer, and I worked on the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the Deep Underground Neutrino Detector, and the Short Baseline Mirror Detector. I did mechanical design work for these projects, and I worked on the qualification of sensors for the LSST camera. In this sense, center image um, is prototype of the thermal test system I worked on for one of the LCT camera modules. And on the right, I was in the gowning room where we had to suit up before entering the clean room to do measurements for the LCT detectors. We had to pretty much cover everything but our eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, shout out to um, my advisor, uh, Stephen Belvia, who I think is on the line right now, and uh, Justine Helt uh, when I was at Brookhaven National Lab. <coughs> I'm currently at the University of Arizona doing research at Stewart Observatory on ultraviolet astrophysics and instrumentation for my physics PhD. I currently work on four projects. First, I'm doing technology development of diffraction gratings for ultraviolet astrophysics in collaboration with the University of Iowa. Second, I'm designing and testing the calibration system for a stratospheric balloon telescope for, called Fireball. Third, I'm analyzing gaseous flows of distant galaxies from data taken with the Palomar Cosmic Web Imager to understand galaxy evolution. And fourth, I'm designing the diffraction gratings test setup for the NASA SmallSat Astro. On the left here is the Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility in Nowhere, New Mexico, called Fort Sumner. Um, where, and this is where we assemble and launch our stratospheric UV balloon telescope called Fireball. 
And no, it's not the ones that we saw on the news. <laughs> so it's looking up instead of down. <laughs> um, on the top right here um, is the clean room and the experimental setup of, uh, the, at the University of Arizona, where I measure new diffraction grading samples that are designed and manufactured at the University of Iowa. On the bottom right here, I'm in Fort... Oh. I see. Thank you. I'm in Fort Sumner soldering together parts of the fireball calibration system um, in the last uh, pre-campaign um, period in 2018 that got canceled, but I'll get into that more later. Um, so I, I'm soldering together parts of the fireball calibration system that I designed, and I'm doing this in the dark since part of the team needed the lights off to test some telescope optics. So what you can't see in your backyard. Let me first give you some background on the astrophysics and instrumentation of my research. If you go out with your telescope on a dark night and look at a galaxy in the sky, you can really only see the very center of the galaxy, about the middle 15 kiloparsecs of it or so. For scale, the distance between Earth and the sun is a hundredth of a parsec. The stuff surrounding that very central part of the galaxy is the accreting, recycling, diffuse gases, and outflows that are completely invisible. This invisible part of galaxies is what makes up the circumgalactic medium and beyond to the intergalactic medium. Our current theory of star formation postulates that gas is recycled and flow back into the disk over about a million years or so. And this is one of the mechanisms that trigger star formation. We believe that galactic inflows and outflows to and from the circumgalactic medium are what make up the cosmic web and the universe here. This is a simulation of the cosmic web where each tiny little dot, these tiny dots, is a galaxy. Hmm. On the bottom right here is a galaxy, this, this um, white dot, Here's the, the main galaxy. And the fuzzy part is a filament of hydrogen that extends outward from the galaxy. This is just a high, tiny hint of the cosmic web we have yet to fully uncover. And notice how long and large this filament is compared to the galaxy. Understanding the delicate balance between um, galactic inflows and outflows will help us understand how they govern the formation and destruction of stars and galaxies. Um, can I just get uh, a show of hands? Who knows um, what spectroscopy is and diffraction gratings? And so um, it seems like a lot of people do. So maybe I, I don't, I won't bore you with a ton of the details, but um, I'll just um, go over the basics. So what can we do about the gas that we can't normally see surrounding galaxies? We can use spectroscopy which is um, the study of the absorption and emission of light and other radiation by matter. So the light comes to us and gets split into um, its constituent wavelengths or colors in a spectrum. All objects have their own spectrum, like a fingerprint or signature. Um, so we can identify what elements they're made out of. So, you know, we get continuous um, spectra from stars and then we get um, emission spectra from clouds of gas illuminated by background source. Um, and we also get absorption spectra after um, light passes through the gas. So, which is exactly the opposite spectrum of the emission spectrum. And um, this series of images shows how the Hubble Space Telescope um, images were used to study the chemical makeup of the Southern Crab Nebula. Hubble Space Tel Telescope Imaging Spectrograph or STIS divides the light from the nebula's filaments to record emission from hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and nitrogen. And the combination of spectroscopy and imaging allows um, us to uh, see the distribution of these certain elements throughout the nebula. So the shape and the distribution of these elements are different for each element. And since different materials give off different colors, um, we can discern um, one element from another. 
and their spectral line widths depend on temperature, composition, and motion. So a spectrum can be displayed as a picture or on a graph, and each color is a different wavelength of light. Um, spectroscopy allows us to study a, a large variety of things. For example, we can identify gases um, in planetary atmospheres and minerals on planetary surfaces. We can figure out what stars are made of and how fast they're rotating. Um, we can detect and characterize planets um, orbiting distant stars. We can measure the temperature and speed of gases in the center of an active galaxy. Uh, we can infer the presence of black holes and dark matter, unravel interactions between colliding galaxies, and even calculate the expansion rate and age of the universe. So spectroscopy can do pretty much everything. Um, so does everyone know what a spectrograph is? Uh, or, okay, I'll, I'll go into a little more detail here. So the spectrograph is what splits light into its constituent um, wavelengths. So this is what we use to make, um, to, to get these spectra from objects in the universe. It's made up of a slit, um, a couple of mirrors, a diffraction grating, and a detector. The first light travels from a telescope through the slit in the spectrograph to a collimating mirror. And it this collimating mirror lines up all the entering rays of light parallel to one another before the parallel rays re reach a finely scored plate of glass. And this is called the diffraction grating. And when light bounces off this plate, um, it separates the light from the objects we look at into separate colors. So this diagram specifically shows um, a reflection grating. Rotating this grating controls which wavelengths of light reach the second mirror here. And um, the second mirror is what focuses that light onto the detector, such as um, a charge couple device, CCD, or a multi-channel plate detector, an MCP. The detector converts photons into electrical signals that a computer interprets to measure the brightness of different wavelengths. Um, so let's first talk about how light behaves. There are three concepts that sound really similar, but we, we shouldn't confuse them with one another. There's dispersion, refraction, and diffra diffraction. You can make rainbows from white light in a couple of different ways through dispersion or diffraction. Dispersion creates one rainbow, whereas diffraction can create multiple sets of rainbows, known as diffraction orders. And dispersion is when white light passes through a glass prism and gets separated into different colors. And refraction happens when the light bends as they pass from one medium to another. And this is, um, and this is why if you put a pencil in a cup of water, um, it looks like it has a, it's broken between the air and glass and, and water interface. So diffraction occurs when light bends as it passes around an edge or through a slit. Um, that is physically the approximate size of or even smaller than the light's wavelength. So as light passes through these slits or barriers, they can constructively or destructively interfere to create bright or dark fringes like the ones we see here. Today, I'll focus on diffraction and how that's applied to telescope instrumentation and astrophysics. So let me first give you a little bit more background about this part of the spectrograph, the, the diffraction grading. This is the part of UV spectrographs that I specialize in. So on the left is a reflective diffraction grading and it's diffracted light. The grading is made up of microscopic grooves and the grooves are so small that you can't see them with the naked eye. When light reflects off the surface of a reflective grating, you see a a light pattern with stripes of light. And these grouped stripes of light are denoted by the letter M, which stands for, for mode or order of diffraction. For example, um, M equals zero means that the grating is acting as a mirror. So it would just be a reflection of the light incident on the grating. So it's just white light. And so the left of the zeroth order are the first and second orders and to the right is the negative first order. These dark stripes where light destructively interferes and light um, constructively interferes, um, makes these uh, dark and bright fringes. So if you've ever taken a physics class before, this acts exactly like the slit experiments. 
and it shows you that light behaves in a wave-like manner. Although I focus on reflection gratings, some researchers focus on transmission gratings, but both types of gratings have groove-like patterns like this. Here are some examples of what these microscopic grooves look like. They can be a sawtooth shape or, um, or they can be bumps like this, or they can be half circles, um, rectangular grooves, or triangles. They can be any combination of shapes that you can think of, and they don't even have to be uniformly shaped throughout the grading surface. So on, on the right here, it shows how light passes through a transmissive grating rather than reflecting off the surface um, as a reflective grating would. And the right panel of this picture shows how light diffracts and creates patterns after it passes through the grating from the bottom to the top. This is a timeline of the formation and evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to the present day. Times are measured from the moment of the Big Bang. I specialize in UV astrophysics, where we study the development of galaxies, stars, and planets that formed approximately 1.3 to 11.5 billion years ago in the cosmic timeline. This is equivalent to redshifts of 0.1 to 3. When we look at light coming from distant galaxies, we're looking at galaxies as they were millions to billions of years ago when the light was first emitted from those galaxies. The idea is to observe galaxies at different points in the cosmic timeline and piece together information to get a complete theory of galactic evolution. Using a spectrograph optimized for the wavelength of interest, we can look at different wave bands of objects in the universe. Just keep in mind that spectrographs built to look at different wavelengths do not all look the same. For example, radio spectroscopy uses antennae instead of diffraction gratings. Diffraction gratings are used for optical to UV wavelengths and sometimes um, soft X-ray. Because of how different instruments are for different wavelengths, astrophysicists tend to specialize in a particular wavelength. I specialize in the UV wave band where we can use spectrographs like the one that we discussed here. Ultraviolet radiation is a signature of hotter objects, typically from the early to late stages of a star or galaxy's evolution. Some young massive stars and old stars grow hotter and produce high en higher energy radiation near their birth or death. In wavelengths lower in energy than the UV, Clouds of gas and dust would block our view in many directions across the Milky Way and into other galaxies. The UV wavelength is really useful to see how things form or die in the universe within galaxies and on the periphery. You can see how looking at different wavelengths give you different information. From low energy or long wavelength light to high energy or short wavelength light, there's radio, infrared, optical, ultraviolet, and X-ray. The UV images of M81 on the upper right and the Whirlpool galaxy on the lower left show the hottest components of the galaxies. On the lower right, the upper panel is an ultraviolet image of the star Mira that reveals a long tail not seen invisible in the lower panel. These fuzzy tails are exactly what we're looking for to understand galaxy evolution. But UV observations are difficult. So we know that UV observations can tell us a lot, but why don't you hear that much about it? UV astrophysics is actually a very small field that we're working on growing. And by UV, I'm talking about 150 to about 300 nanometers. And depending on the scientists you ask, that range might differ a little bit. UV light needs to be observed from space. We're really lucky that the Earth's atmosphere blocks most incoming UV radiation so that we don't get burnt to a crisp and so life is sustainable on Earth. But it makes life hard for UV astronomers. Spacecrafts are not easy to make. They're expensive to launch and they're expensive to engineer um, because we need very specific materials and expertise. UV astronomy compared to other wave bands, such as um, the visible, infrared, and radio are lagging behind and is largely unexplored. 
This is due to technical difficulties in developing high efficiency detectors and gratings, high reflectivity mirrors, and contamination robust coatings for UV instruments. To add to that challenge, the objects that we are aiming to look at are very faint and very diffuse, like the tenuous gases that are inflowing and outflowing from galaxies. There currently aren't really any off the shelf technologies and devices that are specialized for the UV. Three main technologies that need to be optimized for the UV are detectors, materials and thin film coatings, and diffraction gratings. Detectors such as CCDs or MCPs need to be high efficiency, high sensitivity, and low noise. High efficiency means that most photons that hit the detector get read out as a signal. High sensitivity means that you can detect something that's very faint or low signal. There are different types of noise from the detector as well. Read noise is inherent to the process of converting photons hitting the detector to what is read out by the computer. Dark noise can be an issue if the detector isn't sufficiently cooled and photon or shot noise is due to statistical variations in the arrival time of the photons onto the detector. To detect faint UV signals in the sky, we need a detector that is high efficiency, high sensitivity, and low noise. Secondly, the choice of materials is also really important to make sure that light traveling from what we're looking at in the universe is making it to the detector. Detectors that are operated cold, such as CCDs or MCPs, will force form traces of condensable material on their surfaces, even in the vacuum of space, which will destroy UV performance permanently. Any contamination that settles on the optics will be opaque in the UV. We can prevent these condensates by enclosing and vacuum sealing it, um, the detector behind a warm window. But suitable window materials only exist for UV wavelengths longer than about 120 nanometers. Even then, there's only about 60 to 70% light transmission. The image on the left here shows a micro channel plate detector behind a UV transmissive magnesium fluoride window. And on the right shows a diagram of the different parts of an, of an MCP. UV light must be able to get through the protective window to the detector below. The current state of the art technology is the use of lithium fluoride onto glass substrates to make UV reflective mirrors and gratings. We can see here on the graph on the left that through testing of different materials, we can find what is most reflective in the UV. Although bare aluminum, this line in orange, shows a lot of promise at nearly 90% reflectivity, it oxidizes over time so that it's no longer reflective in the UV. The addition of a coating of lithium fluoride makes it less reflective at around 60%, but protects the aluminum from oxidizing. In the past decade, our colleague Manuel Chiara at NASA developed a process where he found that heating these lithium fluoride crystals smoothed the structures out more, which increased UV reflectivity back to around 80 to 90% for UV wavelengths. This lithium fluoride coating technology is currently being applied to the mirrors and gratings of the NASA small set telescope, Aspera, that I'll talk shortly about. The trade-off to using this high reflectivity material is that we must carefully monitor the coatings on these mirrors and gratings since they are easily destroyed by moisture. So everything that we talk about in the UV has a really um, expensive trade-off. <laughs> Um, so in, in UV astrophysics, we need reflective diffraction gratings that are high efficiency and low, low scatter. The performance of a grating is defined by diffraction efficiency, which is the ratio between the intensity of light hitting the grating to the intensity of light diffracted to a specific order at the detector. High efficiency means that most of the light incident on the grating is diffracted to a particular order. Surface and groove shape imperfections cause reflection losses or scatter, lowering the diffraction e efficiency. And um, 
we're still trying to perfect the manufacturing of these grooves. I specialize in the measurement of UV reflective diffraction grading samples for technology development. I'm working with two other grad students from the University of Iowa. First, Jared optimizes and simulates the performance of gratings based on their groove profile and density. Then Cecilia takes that information and manufactures the grading sample and coats it with a UV reflective layer. The samples then get sent out to me in Arizona to measure using the setup here. The largest rectangular chamber with selectable light sources here is called a monochromator. Mono means one and chroma means color. So with this instrument, you can select one wavelength at a time and use either the deuterium light source or the xenon light source. I choose which light source to use based on whether I want a continuum spectrum or sharp and bright emission lines. The chosen wavelength of light is then directed into the collimating chamber, the smaller rectangle here, to redirect rays to be parallel to one another. This is called a collimated beam, which can be used to uniformly illuminate my test sample in this goniometer chamber. In the goniometer, I can rotate the grading sample and um, the detector all the way around to measure diffraction orders at different angles. This helps me determine the efficiency of the grading sample. Throughout this measurement process, I'm learning how to improve the method of measurements. Technology development is an iterative process between Jared, Cecilia, and I, as we learn how to better simulate, optimize, manufacture, and measure these grading samples. Here's what my experimental setup looks like in real life. The left and right photographs are of the same setup, but some things are more visible in one than the other. In the back are the deuterium uh, and xenon light sources that can be selected with a flip mirror in the center. The light from there goes into the monochromator and through an entrance slit. And it's this uh, large stainless steel rectangle in the back. The selected wavelength of light exits the monochromator through an exit slit into the collimating chamber where light is oriented so the rays are parallel to each other. And finally, the collimated beam uniformly illuminates the grating and the goniometer. The grating is mounted in the center of the cylinder here where it can be rotated to change the angle of incidence. To measure the diffracted light, I can use either the built-in detector here below, which is a scintillator with a photomultiplier tube where I can read out the diffraction order intensity as a current, or I can use the CCD camera that you see mounted off to the goniometer here. The photomultiplier tube or PMT is a detector that can rotate around the grating to diffracted orders of light, whereas the CCD camera is fixed in place. So there are trade-offs for using either one. I'm currently using the CCD camera to visualize how the diffracted orders look. And um, the PMT, on the other hand, only gives me a number reading. So I'm trying to balance the use of both. I suspect that there are currently some misalignments to the area of the grading sample I would like to illuminate. So to troubleshoot this, I plan on using a visible light laser to in, in air to verify optical alignment before testing in UV under vacuum again. And UV testing all has to be under a vacuum since the atmosphere would absorb most of the UV light coming from the light sources. So I know that was a lot of information just now about the technology of UV instrumentation for astrophysics, but don't worry if you didn't get it all down. I just wanted you to see all the possibilities there are for technology development. If anyone is looking for a career path or a new career path, this field is incredibly interdisciplinary. There's chemistry, all types of engineering, material science, um, computer science, and so much more. There's no one way to get to work on space technology. And I'm actually hinting really hard here. We always need more people in the UV astrophysics world. Right now, there are only enough of us that we know each other by name, like <laughs> when we cite each other's papers. But I digress. Here's some of the main takeaways 
that I want you to focus on. First, detectors have to be really good at seeing faint structures and be efficient at converting incoming light um, or photons into electrons that the computer reads. Second, the choice of materials and coatings are really important so that we don't block or absorb UV light in our windows, mirrors, um, gratings, and detectors. And lastly, diffraction gratings need to be manufactured in a way where groove structure imperfections are minimized so that we can get clear and intense diffraction orders. Let's circle back to the science behind why we work so hard to develop these high sensitivity and high throughput instruments. As I touched upon earlier, simulations of structure formation in the universe predict that galaxies are embedded in a cosmic web where the majority of matter exists as extremely hot and ionized gas. This material has been studied indirectly for decades in absorption against background sources. But observing distant galaxies directly is still not commonly done. And having a larger sample of direct observations would help constrain the three-dimensional morphology of the underlying cosmic web. So this is how astronomers look at a foreground galaxy's intergalactic medium and its movement into and out of the galaxy with the help of a background light source. Recall that looking at light after it passes through gas clouds give us an absorption spectrum. And um, note that a single galaxy in the cosmic web is just a really tiny dot, like what I circled here. If that doesn't make you feel incredibly tiny in this vast universe, I don't know what will. My research focuses on direct observations of distant galaxies. In particular, the distant galaxies we choose to look at are called quasars, which are the brightest objects in the universe. The reason why quasars are so luminous is because the centers of these galaxies host supermassive black holes that are creating or pulling in lots of surrounding matter. Normally, black holes aren't visible, but because these host galaxies have black holes that are actively disturbing the matter around them, the matter becomes so energetic that it glows. The image on the right here is an artist's rendition of a quasar. The name for these galaxies, quasars or QSOs, comes from scientists initially not knowing what they are, so they were called quasi-stellar objects. But they're not actually stars. In fact, they're, they're galaxies, but this name stuck. Quasars are really popular for studying the cosmic web or the intergalactic medium that is postulated to connect all the galaxies in the universe because of their extreme luminosities. It also helps that quasars exist throughout the universe so we can look at them in um, different points in cosmic time. So what do I mean when I say that I focus on direct observations of distant galaxies rather than indirect observations? It means that instead of looking at the gas on the outskirts of a foreground galaxy here, represented by the semi-transparent orange arrows. I'm looking directly at the background quasar itself, shown by these arrows in blue. Remember that looking at light after it passes through clouds of gas gives you absorption spectra, but looking directly at a cloud of gas illuminated by light gives you emission spectra. This is because um, atoms and molecules are excited as they glow and emit light. You may be wondering, we're looking in a single direction, a single line of sight. So how do you even look at the intervening gas versus the quasar itself, which is further out? The reason we can probe out to different distances is because of spectroscopy. The things that are located further away from us are redshifted more than those closer to us. In other words, the quasar that is further from us can be seen at longer wavelengths than the intervening gas, which is at shorter wavelengths. Because the universe is continually expanding, objects that are further from us emit wavelengths that are, become more stretched out than those closer to us. So my research focuses on the direct observations of gas flowing around distant galaxies here, called quasars through emission spectra. 
most things in the universe are made up of mostly hydrogen, stars, galaxies, and all the dust and gas in between. Hydrogen is the most ubiquitous and most abundant element in the universe. When we look at gas swirling around distant quasars, made up of mostly hydrogen, sometimes we can find glowing cosmic web filaments through emission lines. As the quasar's supermassive black hole irradiates and tugs on these hydrogen and gas clouds, with its enormous gravity, the hydrogen gas fluoresces and emits light as the hydrogen atoms get excited. So hydrogen is made up of a single proton as the nucleus and a single electron that orbits it. When a hydrogen atom gets excited, the electron goes into a higher energy state, and as it falls back into the ground state, it emits light or fluoresces. The type of emission in, in this diagram is what we call Lyman alpha emission. We can extract a bunch of information by looking at emission spectra of the millions of hydrogen atoms that glow within these gas clouds as they feed into the cosmic web. There are two missions that I'm on that look for the missing matter in the universe and the faint and diffuse gas that surrounds galaxies. First is a balloon-borne telescope called Fireball. And, and Fireball um, stands for the Faint Intergalactic Medium Redshifted Balloon. So it's a mouthful. So we just say Fireball. And it's not going to come crash landing, like hopefully not. <laughs> um, and the second is a NASA small sat mission called Aspera that's, that would, is going to be in low Earth orbit. The faint intergalactic medium redshifted emission balloon, Fireball, is a mission designed to observe faint emission from the circumgalactic and intergalactic medium of galaxies at around a redshift of 0.7 for the first time. This redshift corresponds to an age, the age of the universe at about um, 7 million years. This telescope is designed to look at some of the faintest structures in the universe huge clouds of hydrogen gas that we think flow into and out of galaxies. We want to understand how those huge gases of hydrogen gets into a galaxy and creates a star. Fireball is really unusual as a telescope. It's not in space and it's not on the ground. It's a telescope that hangs from a cable from a balloon and observes for 24 hours only as it floats up 130,000 feet up in the stratosphere at the edge of space. And this thing is 2.3 tons. This is, um, so this is at the edge of space because being close to space is much cheaper than being in space itself. So these two pictures show the gondola, which contains Fireball's telescope and all the instrumentation, including the spectrograph, cooling system, control system for um, pointing and stabilization. So here, the gondola doors are being opened to take test images during the pre-flight campaign. On the right, the gondola was transported by this huge crane called Big Bill in preparation for flight. Because wind and weather conditions have to be just right for the balloon flight to happen, more launches were scrubbed than not, even after an entire night of preparation. The last fireball launch happened in September 2018, as I was just starting my PhD. This is the picture of Fireball during that flight. You can see how ginormous the balloon is compared to the payload, which is a tiny dot. But in this picture, the heartbreaking thing is that the balloon is supposed to be spherical and fully inflated. So there was probably a hole where the balloon, uh, in the balloon where the, hydro, the, the helium leaked out and it ended up crash landing in the New Mexico desert less than 50 miles from our Fort Sumner launch site. This hard landing cracked and damaged a mirror and field corrector lens. But since the optic change it, uh, shapes haven't really changed significantly, the cracked edges were just sanded down and the optics are to be reused for our next flight. Since this flight, I've designed a system to allow for the capability of in-flight calibration measurements. Fireball is made up of a balloon and a cable that suspends the gondola. 
the telescope flies as it's suspended by this ginormous balloon that is filled with helium and it is able to support 2.3 tons of weight. The gondola is the heart of the telescope with optics, spectrograph, control system, calibration system, data uplink and downlink system, and um, as it hangs from the balloon on a cable, the control system stabilizes any swaying and controls the rotation of the entire gondola and the tip tilt of the siderostat. When the gondola doors are open, the siderostat, this flat mirror with tip tilt capability, redirects light from the target galaxy up and into onto the, parab uh, the parabolic um, primary mirror and down into the vacuum spectrograph tank containing the focal correctors and spectrograph. So the diagram on the right is simplifying the light path a little bit. So this is light coming from a galaxy hitting the siderostat. Um, it's directed up onto the primary mirror and then the primary mirror that's parabolic um, the light path comes down and focuses at the field lens down on the spectrograph. For the upcoming fall 2023 flight, I developed an in-flight calibration system for Fireball. Part of the calibration system is the calibration cap, which I named the UFO because it kind of looks like a UFO. Um, it sits right on top of the spectrograph lens tank. Using SOLIDWORKS, I designed the UFO to infer interface with the top of the spectrograph tank and made, I had to be careful to make sure that it didn't hit the siderostat as it tips and tilts. An optical engineering colleague optimized the angle of the circular conical design in ZMAX, which is a light ray simulation software for fireball wavelengths, which is 200 to 208 nanometers. The UFO is made of a top cover with a donut hole where the shutter blades are in the center a middle conical section where UV fibers mount perpendicular to the conical surface and feed light into the cavity, and an adapter plate to mount the UFO assembly onto the spectrograph tank. The shutter can allow light to open, um, can open to allow light into the spectrograph tank or close to take exposures for calibration images. To take calibration images, I designed a system on the other end of the UV fibers that allows to select and turn on one of two light sources to illuminate the UFO cavity. The cavity is illuminated as the UV fibers direct light into, onto the shutter blades at an optimized angle and then reflects off them to cre create uniform and diffuse light that is measured in this, by the spectrograph below in this tank. There are two types of calibration that are done, wavelength calibration and flux calibration. The zinc lamp is used for wavelength calibration since it has really sharp and bright known emission lines. Whereas the deuterium lamp is used in flux calibration for its known continuum lines at UV wavelengths. We've gone through a couple of design iterations so far. From the first to second UFO iteration, I've increased the shutter size to, to increase light throughput and decrease the total height of the assembly to give the siderostat more room to move without colliding with the UFO. Here's the opto electrical mechanical system that I developed, um, designed and developed in SolidWorks. I made mechanical drawings, had parts machine and hardware put together for the fireball calibration system. In the middle of this cylindrical enclosure, there's a plate that holds the calibration lamps and optics on one side, and the other side of the plate in the back here holds all the power, electronics, and control cables. The eight UV fiber cables are bundled together and split into two common ends. One end goes to the collimating lens above the deuterium lamp, and the other goes to the collimating lens above the zinc lamp. The light outputted from each lamp goes through its own focusing lens, shutter, and collimating lens before entering the UV fiber that splits it into eight ends at the UFO. Flux calibration is meant to correct flux variations introduced by optical components in the light path, such as the tel um, telescope, uh, fiber, spectrograph, and CCD. 
This is also known as the transmission of all the optical components. The transmission is calculated by comparing the spectrum of a known source, such as the deuterium lamp, with the spectrum attained with the instrument. Wavelength calibration converts detector pixel positions along the spectrum into wavelength values in either angstroms or nanometers. But this is done using a known zinc lamp emission line. On the other side of the plate, inside the calibration box enclosure, I had to methodically stack and organize all of the power converters, lamps, power supply boards, and shutter controller boards, signal cables, and a pressure and temperature sensor. It's really important to keep track of every single cable as they're routed out of this enclosure. So I know which cable goes to gondola power and um, which ones go to the guider onboard computer to send signal to turn lamps on and off, open and close shutters, and read out pressure and temperature readings. A data downlink system will tell us if the pressure or temperature is out of spec for our lamps or electronics to run. To test the synth system independently of the gondola, I developed an Arduino program that serves as the control and readout of the calibration system. Here's Fireball's fully integrated payload. The gondola has a height of about five meters and a weight of about 2.3 metric tons, including the 500 kilogram ballast. The calibration system and spectrograph look really tiny here when they're fully integrated into the payload. The top of the spectrograph tank where the UFO sits is hidden in the cutout of the sidereostat. We're hopeful that the 2023 launch of Fireball can bring in some new detections to map the circumgalactic medium at intermediate redshifts. This coming launch would be the fourth launch of Fireball. The three previous launches were in 2007 from Palestine, Texas, and um, 2009 and 2018 launches were in Fort Sumner, New Mexico. With each launch, we learn from failures, such as pointing control fail failure from a pivot failure. And um, one time there was a lack of circumgalactic medium emission um, from detections from our target galaxies. The current iteration of Fireball includes redesigns to, overall, um, to increase overall instrument throughput, increase the field of view, and increase um, detector sensitivity in addition to a new in-flight calibration capability. Yes, two quick questions about Fireball. Yeah. How many 24-hour flights um, are you hoping to get out of the telescope? Like, Just for a single flight? Uh, like best, best, best case, like two, two, two parts wear out, um, even with um, even the balloon operates perfectly. Um, how many flights might you get out of the telescope? That's a good question. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, as long as it's funded, I, I think it'll keep going up, to be honest. So it depends on, um, so for each launch, um, we have to write a proposal to NASA to say, okay, we have to pay all these, these personnel, these students, these um, scientists. Um, but I mean, with each iteration, maybe the next iteration, we won't even use the same detector. So wear and tear maybe is a little less of an issue. And then what, what diagram should the pool be? That's testing in sea level or just the the pool fit have any affected that altitude? So this here is um, sealed up with an O-ring. So oh, okay. when it gets sent up, it's still at atmospheric pressure. Okay. Um, so there will be air in there moving around and hopefully cooling um, everything that needs to be cooled. Yeah, so that was our good questions. Um, any other questions? Figure out what happened to the last balloon and is the balloon stronger this time around? Um, so there were really unusual weather patterns and wind. So that could have caused um, something to rip um, on its way up. Or I don't know if it's the way that the balloon train got released. Um, unfortunately, I was there, but it launched the, the week after I left because it gets canceled so often. Um, I was like, oh, maybe this time that I'm here, it'll launch. but I left, so I didn't actually get to see it. But it's either the way they released it from Big Bill or it's the weather, you know, that 
made it um, move weird. Right. Oh, the siderostat, the mirror that tilts? Yeah. Um, so nominally, we can only have like two to three degrees of sway. So we work with um, Kness um, Center for, I don't know, astrophysics in France. They actually come in and do our control system. So um, nominally, we know that we have to limit it to a sway of like two or three degrees um, for it to... Yeah, yeah. So control systems is a very very important part. How do you control the direction in which the telescope, the azimuth? So the whole thing rotates on that pivot point. And then so you control there there's um there's also a, the tip tilt mirror. It it like does this and this as well. So were there jets or something that rotated under the balloon? Um it's it's some like mechanical pivot um that I don't know the full details of. Oh. Yeah. Um, so moving on to ASPERA, uh, the Pioneers or Astrophysics Pioneers program is a NASA program that started in 2020. And this is intended um, to use small size hardware. The missions that are expected include small sats, balloon payloads, like the one that we just talked about, and payloads attached to the ISS. And these um, missions have a $20 million cost cap. So that may seem like a lot, but it's actually not for missions like these. Um, the cheapest part of, of this is actually um, the materials and getting things ma manufactured for these payloads. Um, the expensive part is actually all the overhead for the university and the personnel. <laughs> so if you think $20 million is a lot for a space mission, it's really not. <laughs> so just fun fact. Um, ASPERA is a small sat mission that was selected and funded by this NASA grant program. And we have a projected launch date of 2025. At low Earth orbit, ASPERA will create the first map of galactic halos in nearby galaxies for the first time. Galactic halos are the invisible component of galaxies that extend far away from the center and may contain nearly as much mass as the main galaxy disks themselves. The surround galaxies are made up of stars like old globular clusters, um, hot gas known as the galactic corona and dark matter. The part of ASPERA, the part that ASPERA focuses on looking at is the galactic corona, which is part of the circumgalactic medium. In theory, the hot gas and plasma make up a significant part of the galaxy's halo and plays an important role in its evolution, but its exact role isn't really understood very well. So ASPERA observes this hot gas through O6 emission, which is oxygen that is ionized five times. So five electrons are stripped off. If we zoom in to this really diffuse hot gas on the outskirts of a galaxy in the galaxy's corona, we would see lots of oxygen atoms with electrons stripped off due to intense heat. And O6 is what we use to trace this incredibly hot part of galactic halos. Here's a sample of ASPERA's target selection. They're galaxies that are edge on or close to being edge on so that we can discern the extent of the gal galactic halo component from the galactic disk. This can also help us map how far out the hot gas in the halo reaches away from the disk and the main goal of looking at the galactic halo's hot gas is to collect important clues to galaxy formation. After all, it evolved along with the rest of the galaxy and possibly made up of the material ejected from supernovae and other energetic events in the gal galaxy's past. The halo extends for hundreds of thousands of light years, much farther than the disk of stars itself. And um, I put, a little green circle here to show just how much I can extend out. 
And this halo is assumed to be like a, a sphere-like volume around the, the galactic center. Yeah. Yeah, mostly edge on, or just like maybe plus or minus like five to 10 degrees. Yeah, yeah. So if the galactic disk is here, if there's something spewing out, we can tell it's spewing out. Because if it's like, you know, if it's tilted toward us, we can't really tell if, is that part of the disk of the galaxy or not? Yeah. So on the upper left um, is an image of uh, the simulated 06 emission. Um, and it's a distribution of those 06 emission from a Milky Way type galaxy. Uh, these circles um, labeled alpha and beta on the map show what it would look like if a telescope pointed to detection and non-detection re regions. The observation of um, these 06 filaments um, off the gal galactic disk is a bit due to luck. Um, although we can infer where filaments may be located for galactic halos that have been observed in X-rays before. The image on the bottom left is what we see from a detector if we looked at an object like the one simulated here. Simulations help us determine the spectral and spatial resolution that is needed for the mission. Computations like this help drive the mission payload requirements. On the right here in black and white is um, Galaxy NGC um, 891, which demonstrates uh, detection in black and non-detection fields in gray from a previous telescope on the sounding rocket called FUSE, Far Ultraviolet Spectrograph Explorer. ASPERA's mission builds off of observations and instrumentation from FUSE. ASPERA will look at 06 emission at 103.2 nanometers using two parallel spectrograph channels in a single payload. And this is the isometric view of the payload um, here and a top-down view of the payload here. For each channel, light goes through each entrance aperture and um, reflects off the off-axis parabola onto gratings that separate light out into spectra before focusing onto a single detector. Despite being such a small instrument, so um, ASPERA, the payload is like, I don't know, yay big and yay high. So um, it's it's really tiny, but despite being so small, um, ASPERA will achieve high sensitivity measurements, which are enabled by the technological advances over the last decade in UV coatings, gratings, and detectors. So to wrap it all up, um, here we see that gas flows out from M82, the cigar galaxy in this gorgeous Hubble image. Um, to an invisible galactic medium. And as I scoured the internet, hoping to at least find one, a single real image of the circumgalactic medium and galaxy halos to show you, I've only come across diagrams like these, um, along with a multitude of computer simulations showing how gas is spewed far out from the disk of galaxies and eventually fall back onto the disk to form stars. This just shows that there's so much work to be done on UV astrophysics and technology development so that we can directly observe and map the CGM for the first time. The amount of this invisible gas is comparable to what we see in these beautiful Hubble images. Fireball and Aspera are just the very beginning of revealing the diffuse universe. Thank you all so much for coming and listening. How do you limit looking just at oxygen six with Aspera? So we can limit um, which wavelength we're looking at by um, looking. So we're looking at, uh, so we know at a certain redshift. So let's say we're looking at um, O6 on earth. Actually, I don't know how possible that is because it has to be super hot, but let's just assume we can on earth. Um, we, we know that it's at a certain wavelength and um, there are two lines, it's a doublet. And say we're looking at one of these lines. Um, we know that, okay, we can calculate at, at this redshift away from us, this um, spectral line is going to redshift 
um, to a certain wavelength. So we look for that line at that wavelength. And we, we also from simulations and calculations can expect, okay, this is how strong this line should be. Um, so we can discern it from like uh, light scattered from the sun or um, other, or from defects from the grading. So there's a way to like deconvolve uh, these lines from all those things. These galaxies, the Gypsy galaxies we're looking at, uh, are, is the UV light, the red shift, and is it still in, always still in the UV part of the spectrum? I mean, you shift the, the, the distance so that it's still UV. Right, so this is one of the first questions I had when I first started working in um, UV astrophysics. Um, so even if UV lines are, so UV lines at, at rest, like say we're, we're on earth, right, in a lab. So even if like say the Lyman alpha line is in the UV and it's red shifted um, to, I don't know, visible wavelengths, it's still considered UV astronomy. Um, so for example, uh, one of the projects I'm working on, um, I'm looking at uh, stuff for, um, you know, distance gal galaxies uh, using the Palomar Cosmic Web Imager. So this is a telescope on Earth. So this is still considered UV astronomy. <laughs> yeah. Tony. A lot of work with Tony's yeah, can know, you do it, Tony? I don't know what it's all I have a feeling that some of it I may probably answer a question. Oh, it's very possible. <laughs> I know it's got to see it, but now I have to see how it's going to use it. Yeah. Uh, sure, sure. Um, yeah, Frank, I'm so sorry. How did you choose to study this field? Um, the funny thing is, it kind of chose me. Um, <laughs> so I went to University of Arizona and I was shopping around for advisors, and um, my advisor is actually came in the same year that I did, so she's very new. Um, and she's literally the only one who does um, theory, uh, data analysis, and instrumentation and engineering. So jack of all trades, um, master of none, like myself. So the, um, what I'm interested in um, is actually knowing how to uh, build something from scratch and use it to observe um, something in the sky as well as understand, okay, what are the requirements driving, um, you know, driving this science, um, you know, so for example, what uh, resolution do I need to build this telescope? Um, oh, what do we need to improve? So I want to know everything from the nuts and bolts to the theory and the science. So, um, yeah. Uh, what do you see yourself in the future? Um, so I would like to work at on a research team, either um, in a national lab, I don't know, somewhere like JPL, NASA, or um, industry, wherever, um, wherever it's interesting. <laughs> Did your uh, PhD dissertation rely on successful collection of data from Fireball? Or is the process of just building the instrumentation testing, is that enough there for a, a PhD? So I was just curious, like how, yeah. how scary is it? Like you need Great question. to collect data, otherwise your PhD is down the tube. Yeah, absolutely a great question. Um, so um, it doesn't have to get data successfully. So what we know in instrumentation, things fail all the time. I mean, that's what makes instrumentation really hard. <laughs> um, so luckily um, for my dissertation, what I can do is explain, um, okay, these are this is why things failed and this is what I can improve next time. Um, because the thing is, if I don't, if, if things fail and I can't graduate, um, it can go on for decades, right? Which is how this technology is uh, developed through many, many failures. So um, it's about learning from those failures. Uh, and that can be part of what uh, I can write about in my dissertation, what I learned and um, why it failed. So, yeah. 
Professor, there's something, something you may want to mention. The University of, of Arizona is a dynamic and exciting place, as I understand it. I think that they currently have two hundred sixty million dollars worth worth of research going on. And I want to say something, something about it. That's the sense of the environment that I have there. Yeah, Stewart Observatory is um, extremely wealthy, um, gets a lot of money. Um, I am actually pretty shielded from all of that, to be honest. Um, I think I'm like kind of unusual as a grad student. I um, work from home. I go into lab when I need to. Um, I So I actually came from the physics department, but a lot of physics students um, actually go into other departments to research, like the chemistry department or, um, I don't know, computer science or something, and um, quantum networking. But I went to astrophysics, so um, I actually didn't get to meet a lot of people in, um, in that department, just because, first of all, my work is so different. And second of all, um, I've seen these people in classes like here and there, maybe once or twice, but also the pandemic just like made it completely impossible to um, kind of meet my peers, right? Yeah, so, um, yeah. Oh, on the, so this is my husband, Glenn. Um, and <laughs> yes, he's, uh, he's, um, He's helped, he's actually, he's a mechanical engineer too. And he's taught me so much um, because uh, he worked on electrical systems before. So a lot of the electronics um, I learned from him along with, uh, so he's really great at machining. So I'm like, okay, Glenn, this is um, what I want machined. Can you tell me if these tolerances look like there's something that achieve that are achievable. So because you have to make nice with the machinist, right? Um, you have to make sure it's physically possible and it makes sense. And um, timeline wise, you know, if your tolerances are really, really tight, it's not possible or it's really expensive and it takes a long time. Um, so but yeah, during the pandemic, uh, calibration box was on the dining room table. Um, uh, Glenn did ask me when we would get our dining room table back again. It took um, yeah. it took like two to three months. Um, uh, yeah, it was an interesting time. It seems like your engineering degree has been crucial, essential to the work you're doing. It's almost it seems like it would be impossible to do what you do without your robust undergrad in astronomy, physics, and engineering. So you speak yeah. about like, it seems like you're doing an awful lot of engineering. Oh yeah, um, I got really lucky in the sense that I um, interned um, under Stephen Bellavia and Justine Haupt um, at Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, they, they were the ones, and Jason Farrell, um, they all taught me how to design experimental systems and um, tolerance things, uh, run thermal simulations to make sure things won't, I don't know, delaminate or bend so much that they break as it heats and cools. Um, it really was that internship that made me um, be able to do these experimental setups. Um, much more easily, I guess, than without that experiment experience. Yeah. Well, I kind of look at my job at Haven. Yay. Um, what, what department do you like, what kind of things do you think you can talk about that? Um, so let's see, I um interned um, I guess starting my junior year. And um it's actually through a connection I made here. Um Stephen Bellavia is um in Collider Accelerator Department. And um, I worked with him on LSST and I learned how to design a vacuum experiment system um, for the for, for the camera raft for, LS, for LSST. And um, then uh, because I guess people knew me, I later got hired, um, hired on for LSST. And then after that, um, I worked on a couple of neutrino detector systems 
Um, so I actually applied for the Suli program. So um, if you um, know someone there, definitely contact them and be like, hey, are you taking interns? I mean, networking is so much more important than like anything sometimes. Um, it helps. Who, with, who is it or where? Oh, it helps though. Does he know someone who's taking interns? I mean, it, it's it's worth it to ask around, right? Um, networking helps. Yeah, so I've worked in CAD, physics, and the instrumentation division. Um, and Justine and Steve, I met here or at Custer. Mm -hmm. Jessica, can um, I ask Anyone question? else have any questions? Jessica, can you hear me? I'm on Zoom. Or you can talk to me afterward too. Time it takes to do things like uh, grant proposals versus how much time it spends instrumentation, a design, and actually constructing. Is asking for funding a very significant amount of time, or is that something that you do really quickly? I lucked out in that area. Um, my advisor is extremely good at writing grants. So um, she got, she has a lot of money coming in. And on top of that, Stewart Observatory has a lot of money. Um, so, and, but, you know, when I first started it out, I didn't have funding from, um, I have no way to get, no. Mommy, are you? Oh, wait, is, is there an issue? Yeah, we have a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, why don't you go ahead and do that? We have two people who have questions. Um, let's start with Steve Bellavia. Hi, great talk, Jess. Thanks. So, so I, this is more answering a question. Someone asked, "How far would it shift?" So, if you were at, you, you said around 100 nanometers for uh, oxygen six, so at redshift 0.7, it's uh -huh. 170. That's how it works. It's 0.7. That's what redshift of 0.7 means. You've shifted. 0.7 so okay so 100 becomes 170 so that's an answer to one of the questions it's oh, still gotcha. uv it's still uv it's mm -hmm. just you know moving towards the visible but, oh but i see and 0.7 is pretty far so it's still not you know it's still not going to become visible so right yeah so, so yeah. sometimes it stays in the uv range sometimes it doesn't yeah and it becomes visible but it's still considered uv astrophysics yeah, yeah but that's... as long as yeah it's um, where it came from Alex yep. had a question. Alex? Hello, this is actually Alex's mom. Um, <laughs> and I just wanted to ask Jessica if, um, if possible, to pivot you back to when you first started at Astley and how and if it influenced what you did and how do you think that it helped you or steered you that way? Um, I've always been interested in astronomy since I was like five. Um, I just liked stuff in the sky. Um, I mean, my, my parents who are here, um, hi, mom, dad, they, um, <laughs> uh, they, I mean, they set up, it was like, there was snow on the ground and, um, they set up like duvet covers and stuff with lawn chairs. I still remember this. Um, and there was a meteor shower, the in the dead of winter and we just laid there and watched it. Um, and that was awesome. So, I mean, my parents, uh, I'm sure they, they helped to uh, inspire that interest. Um, uh, my first memory was a, one of my first memories was a meteoroid book or something that my mom read to me <laughs> that she doesn't remember apparently, but I do. <laughs> um, but, yeah. uh, um, so, I came to Astley because I was interested in astronomy and I wanted to, I guess, have a bit more of a community. So um, that helped bolster um, my interest as well. And um, it helps me network, which really helps with um, getting that internship at BNL. Um, and it kind of went on from there. Uh, I, I knew that I had to get a PhD to um, work in the field that I do in research. So um, that's kind of how that path went. Does that kind of answered my question, uh, your question? Yeah, I think yes. the whole family is interested in um, the universe. Yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jess. Hi. Mommy. This is not awkward at all. 
I, 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 I clearly remember driving you to Ashley. Yeah. In the evening, like every, every week. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it was so dark. <laughs> hey. The whole journey. Yeah. Hey, I drive him to, to Ashley almost every week. Sometimes more than once a week. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, yeah, you 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 have to do it because they she couldn't drive yet. Yeah, I was just a baby. You were just <laughs> a baby, yeah. And you ask, "Mom, can yeah. you drive me to Ashley?" Yeah. And of course, yes. Yeah. I still so remember those nights that when we watched the me meteor showers. Yes. With a thick. Ranky and everything. Yeah. Real crop in the morning. <laughs> yeah, I think I was like seven. Yeah. Yeah, I still remember. It was the most meteors I've ever seen in my life. It was the, it was a meteor yeah. storm actually that year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. Do you guys remember which meteor shower? I actually don't. I don't know. Winter months sometimes. Oh, do you do you remember going back to Hong Kong to see the? Uh, oh, that's uh, right. Yeah. So my family's uh, from Hong Kong. Um, I grew up there for a little bit when I was really young, toddler to, um, I guess, child. So I don't know, four to seven ish. Um, but we returned to New York when I was a teenager. Um, maybe a like a seventeen or eighteen. Um, there was like a transit of Venus. Um, so we actually flew back there to see the transit of Venus because mm -hmm. it was better there than here. And yeah. I got to visit my relatives. So it was really hot. I was 15. So my age divided by two right now. <laughs> Literally half a lifetime ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I actually have, um, there's like, okay, here's the pressure sensor and there's a temperature sensor here. So I can, it's like really tiny in this picture, but um, yeah, so if it's not cooling very well and um, it's dangerous for the lamps to keep working um, or if the electronics are gonna overheat and um, so, uh, well, we can turn them off remotely from the uplinking uh, system. Yeah. I know there's talk of uh, NASA returning to the moon. And if they did, would the moon be a good place to set up these type of uh, collection devices? Because there's no atmosphere. Um, so so just for any any telescope systems for the UV? For yeah, for UV systems. Absolutely, that would be great. I mean, not having atmosphere in the way. Because even fireball, um, even at nominal altitude at 130k feet it's only still only like 50 percent transmission <laughs> i had a question you had a slide where um you showed there was uh, a team of three of you and you did the measuring of the um diffraction gratings you were in charge of the mm -hmm. measuring and testing and um Somebody else was in charge of yeah, the magnetic source. Could you talk a little bit more of like that teamwork dynamic and how that loop works? And because uh, I'm sure like what you find out gets fed back to each other. How does that work? Um, so there's like an email chain with our advisors and we also talk to each other on Slack. So I would say, hi, like I found out, you know, I have these images of, um, you know, the diffraction orders. I'm like, I don't know why I'm seeing this or like, why does it look like this? And they'll be like, oh, um, try this. Or like, um, maybe I can coat, coat it um, with a thinner layer next time or simulate um, it with a thinner gold coating layer and see if that improves it. Um, so it's just a constant conversation of uh, what to do next. And then I guess through all these bits and pieces, our, um, we talk to our advisors. It's like, if there's a big decision, it's like, oh, um, can we, try manufacturing another one like with these improved parameters and um something like that yeah but 
ultimately my hope is to actually um, go and work with the um, Jared and Cecilia's advisor for my postdoc. So I can keep working on this, but uh, with a better measurement system. So it's my, my idea is to continue this work and um, hopefully, um, so NASA has something called, uh, you know, you want to raise the technology readiness level. So we want to fly this on like rockets um, to kind of do that. So hopefully I'll, I'll keep working with them since they're earlier grad students. So that would make it easier actually me being there in person. Um, and I think I'm also like crossing over and learning a bit of the simulation as well. So I can simulate and be like, oh, hey, Jared, I saw this. Am I doing it right? Um, you know, what can I do better? So um, yeah, and I asked Cecilia about what I see, is this normal? So it's just that feedback loop all the time. Yeah, and they're great. What an astounding story. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. I was really nervous, so, but it, it's been a nice crowd. Great. Okay.